everyone falls into sin in some area or another. If yours happens to be sex, there's still hope. While you cannot become a virgin again, you can obtain God's forgiveness. You just have to ask for it. And try not to sin that same way again. But what truly <coughs> angers God is when we willfully sin. When we willfully sin. When we know what sin is. When we know what is wrong. And we still choose to do it. That is what angers God. I think and for many of us, we are, we think that we are broken. We think that we are already a lost cause. We think that we've already made some mistake. I'm not just talking about sexually. I'm just talking about a mistake. And that we cannot be repaired. We cannot be fixed. Tonight we are talking about sex. We're not having sex education. I'm not going to teach you about sex education. What I am simply going to teach you is what the Bible says about sex. What God says about sex. Where sex is supposed to take place. That, that is what I'm going to talk about tonight. And I know that for many of you, this is a very uncomfortable subject, especially if you're young. But two things. One, your parents know we were having this talk. Oh, well. And number two, this is something that plagues you as a young person. It plagues you. I was 13 years old when I lost my virginity. I was 13. I was as old as many of you were in this room. I screwed up. I made that mistake. I wasn't a Christian then. I didn't even know there was a God. I knew there was something, but I didn't know that there was a God. And the one thing that I want you to understand, and for people who haven't had sex yet, this right now is me talking to the individuals who have. Listen, we were not broke. I was not broke. I, nobody told me. I just didn't know. And listen, the one thing that I have found out through my faith in Christ is this. Even though that I made a mistake like having sex before marriage, God still loved me. He still came and died for me. And even though I made that mistake, even though I went down that path, there is still hope and salvation and repair for me. I saw many of you shocked when I said that. <laughs> Some of you were kind of like, what did he just say that? Yeah, I'm not perfect, guys, at all, <clears throat> by any means. Just because I'm a pastor does not mean that I've got my, my stuff together. That's far from it. I wanted to cover that tonight very specifically in the beginning because what would happen is as we go and talk about what sex is biblically, those of us who have already experienced it will feel like it's a heavy weight upon us, a burden, a, a, a weight that's like tied around our feet that is pulling us down. And see, so you have to understand it's the complete opposite. We have to come to Christ for forgiveness. Just like Sean said, I said, all right, God, we're going to get this. We got to get this together. He went from living a lifestyle that was in, that involved having sex with different girls to the point where he realized he was about 24. So he realized that he shouldn't be doing that anymore because he knew what was right. And he chose not to do that anymore. He asked for the forgiveness and God forgave him and loved him. You know, I don't necessarily agree with everything the bachelor does, but I will have to say that this guy, Sean, he did get it right. He did stick hardcore through his faith through that entire program. And there's, this is like a 20 minute video. I just cut out like six minutes of it. He goes on and talking about how difficult it was in his faith to be on a show like this, dating 25 some odd girls at one time. And he talked about how his faith was, was challenged deeply by that. And like I said, I'm not agreeing with it, but what I am saying is for him to come out and say this and just talk about the fact that he was labeled as the virgin. And get me, get me, there's nothing wrong with that. Not a thing. There's a great story that I want to share with you in John 8. If you have your Bibles, open up to John 8. If you don't, raise your hand. We will give you a Bible. Take it home. It is yours. You can put your name on it. 
Keep it, read it, love it. It will change your world. If you've got your Bibles, open up to John 8, chapter 1. We are going to read a very interesting story about a woman who was committing adultery, was committing sin sexually. And we're going to see what God's, what Jesus is in particular, his response to her was. And then we're going to, well, we're going to get into it. <laughs> You guys like my bed? It's nice. No. It's actually just a box spring. Oh, you're definitely going to sleep on that. Yeah, I'm definitely sleeping on that. When I get in trouble, that's where Melanie tells me to go. To the box spring. No, I'm just kidding. Yes, sir. The guitars, yeah. yeah. Everybody there? Uh, let's read this. Shh. No, I cannot lay on Not right now. Let's read this. I'm going to read uh, some verses here, so just follow along with me. And then uh, we're going to break this down talk about it a little bit. Because I, I want us to see and understand that even though somebody was, was, was committing adultery, they were committing sexual sin, God still loved them. And see, that doesn't just go for sexual sin. That also goes for any sin in our lives. Some of us think that just because we, we've made mistakes and we've done things wrong, we can't have that connection with God again. Well, that's false. You can. You can have that relationship with God. You have to ask for that forgiveness. Let's check this out. Let's read this. It's called a woman caught in an adultery. It says, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again in the temple. A crowd soon gathered and he sat down and taught them. He was speaking to the he was speaking, he and as he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. Does everybody understand what adultery is? No. Okay, adultery is a woman or a man having sex with somebody who's married. It's adultery. It's it's having sex outside of a relationship, outside of a marriage. That's what adultery is. This woman was caught in the act of adultery, okay? And she was brought into the temple. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses, saw, the law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his fingers. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. <clears throat> then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. This is a woman who is caught in the act of sinning sexually. She was caught in the act was brought to Jesus. And by the law of Moses, which the Jewish people, they, they practiced that law. In the law of Moses, a woman caught in the act of adultery was immediately to be stoned to death. Do you guys know what stoning is? Do you know what stoned to death is? They're throwing boulders at you. They're like throwing big rocks at you. Imagine dying that way. That would be terrible. Unless you got knocked out immediately. That would be a really, really bad way to die. Your ribs being crushed, your stomach being crushed, your, 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 your legs, your head. That would be... <laughs> now they're coming at you, buddy. Shh. What's up, Lord? Did she know that he was married? Did she know that who was married? That the guy that she was having... Uh, probably not. I'm, I mean, maybe she knew that he was. She was a prostitute. Okay, there we go. Clear that up real quick. <laughs> Thought you guys would have got that, but she was a prostitute. We see that Jesus said, <laughs> he said there, neither do I. Go and send no more. Go and send no more. He forgave her. And he told her to go out and send no more. That's exactly what God calls us to. Listen, when we realize, we come to that realization that we should not be doing something. Jesus' very simple words to you is go and sin no more. You come to him and say, God, I, I've messed up. I've made a mistake. I've really messed up here. 
God doesn't beat you. He doesn't take a swatch out and hammer you down. He doesn't stone you. No, he loves you. And he tells you, go and sin no more. But see, what angers God is when we know we shouldn't do something and we still choose to do it. That's a completely different story. I think a lot of us in this room, we can relate to the fact that we know there's some things that we shouldn't be doing, but we are still choosing to do them. If you have already lost your virginity, we're going to talk about that word virgin. If you have already lost your virginity and you are not married, listen, there is still hope. Listen, I was 13 years old when I lost mine. It wasn't until I got deeper in my faith that I realized that I wasn't broken. I didn't need repair. Yes, was there consequences because of that? Oh yeah, there were. There were consequences because of that. Because of the choice that I had chosen, there was, there was consequences. But understand, chosen, 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 whatever. But understand, it's English speaking, it's different than writing, no. But understand, you're not broken. I'm not just talking about like sex. I'm talking about sexual things, oral sex, physical hand sex. That, that, that it's sex, and it's not to happen outside of marriage. That is to take place in marriage. Let's walk through this. What does the Bible say about sex? Open up to Hebrews 13:4 if you have your Bibles. If you don't, I'm just going to read it. What the Bible says specifically about sex is that it's sacred. It's sacred. It's something that is supposed to be an action between a man and a woman in a marriage, and a covenant between God and themselves. It's sacred. 13, 14 says, let marriage be held in high honor among all. So we're talking specifically about marriage being held in high honor. Well, if in marriage, you're allowed to have sex. So within that marriage, there is sex. So we had to hold that marriage in high honor. You know what happens today is that nobody seems to be holding marriage in high honor. They just don't seem to be doing that anymore. They seem to have tuned that out. Or they think that marriage is more of a business affair. Well, it's good if we get married because you make this much money, I make this much money, we can get this tax deduction. Well, if we have five kids, we can get this much of a tax deduction, you know. We'll work this out. They're, they're thinking marriage is more of a business adventure than it is a lifelong commitment. We have to change that thinking. Because what happens is when we erode marriage, we erode the sanctity of sex and marriage. We erode that. We're to hold marriage and sex in high honor. In honor. In marriage. The Bible says that sex is for a man and a woman to become one. Genesis 2.24 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. They shall become one flesh. It also says in here, in mine it says, it says, and is joined to his wife. The Hebrew word for, the, for joined is cling, is cling together. God tells us to cling together. They're joined together. Are you getting the picture? They're joined, they are cling together, clung together. Whatever, you English majors. <laughs> The Bible tells us that that marriage, that union, is for two people, two individuals to become one. That's what the Bible tells us sex is for in the marriage. It's to become one. How do you become one with somebody? You have to give up parts yourself to them, right? So every time that you go out and have sex with somebody, you're giving a part of yourself to them. See, when you're married, you're giving each other yourselves and you're building, a, you're building one person by sharing each, each of yourself with each other. But when you're going out and having sex with different and random people, you're giving a part of yourself to different people. You're not creating a one union there. You're sharing that around with different people. And that in itself is, is, is a disaster. That in itself is just, whoa. It's 
for a union between one man, one woman, to be clung together, to be mended together, to be oneness. Who created sex? Who created sex, guys? Come on. All right. When did God create sex? As soon as we were born. As soon as we were born? Okay, that's true. Adam and Eve. Okay, all right. Adam and Eve. Is there a particular time during the Adam and Eve creation that God created sex? 1570 BC. 1570 BC. I before that, but... Um, was it before or after the fall? Before or after sin? Before. Before, before sin. That makes me very happy, guys. I, I, I give you a round of applause for that. Very good. Very good. You know, most people think that sin was, or that, that sex was created because of sin. It was like God, it was like God was like, oh man, now they sin. Now they're going to have to have sex. Oh man. <laughs> you know, that's just terrible. That's not what my plan was. Oh, that's not what God did, okay? And there's so many people who just assume that. They assume that, hey, God created sex, but it, he created, but he didn't want us to use it until, oh, well, we sinned. Now we have to use it. That, that's not what happens. Listen, God created sex before the fall, and he created for us to enjoy. Who did he create it for? Me. Shh, no, just hold on. Who were the two people we created it for? Adam and Eve. What were they? Human. And what was their relationship status? Marriage. It didn't say, oh, God had them dating. And then they went off into the fruit garden and enjoyed each other. No. That's not what he did. He put them together. He married them. And then he sent them out to be fruitful and multiply. That's what he did. Okay, yeah, that's right. Fruitful. Ha <laughs> ha. Man, I'm a real jokester. But only the middle schoolers got that. That was totally what they No. Just focus. Just focus. Shh. What was what called? The Garden of Eden? No. Okay, what? What was sex called? He doesn't want to say the word. It's okay. <laughs> what was it called at first? Sex. I don't, I don't know if it's changed. Uh, it's lay with one another. Um, you know, sexual intercourse. Yep, definitely. Okay, shh. We don't have to worry about that. It doesn't matter. We're talking about sex. I said before, God created the sex. Shh. He created it. A little bit later, we're going to talk about this. He didn't just create it for a physical <coughs> attraction, for, for a physical purpose. See, God created it to be spiritual. He created it to be mental, to be physical. He created it to be three separate states in one. We're to worship God with our sex. We're to worship God. We're, we're to enjoy sex mentally, physically. God created it for the basis of marriage. He created it for a man and a woman to have in marriage. And there's a resounding thing I keep saying there, and that's the word marriage. Because society has really dumbed down what marriage is. And in doing so, they really have dumbed down the uh, understanding of what sex is. And it's really sad, guys. Because here we take something that's very spiritual, very serious, very sacred, very honorable. And we just bring it down to our humanistic levels and we just pass it out like it's a deck of cards. Like it's worthless. And that's not the way it is at all. That, that's not what God intended and created it to be. Here's a couple reasons why we should wait for sex until marriage or why we should have sex in marriage. One, it's fun. God created it. Enjoy it. It's fun. It's for children. It's to procreate. Go out, be fruitful, and multiply. Okay? You said wait until married. Okay. Be married. Wait until married. Okay. Get married, be fruitful, and multiply. There we go. We got that good? Okay. Shh, hold on. Listen. I saw something on the news today. They're talking about making babies out of Petri dishes. But listen, that's not what God was talking about in Genesis 2. That wasn't it. He wasn't like, let's get the Petri dishes, guys. That's not what he was talking about. He specifically created it for one purpose is to have fun. Second purpose, for children. Third, for oneness. We talked about it. Bonding together of two people. Bonding together of two people. For knowing. A couple learns to know each other 
And no, no other person will understand your spouse the way that you will because there is a knowledge that is gained through that oneness that you should not be sharing with anybody else. And that's why sex before marriage is so volatile. It's because you're allowing knowledge of yourself to be shared. And I'm not just talking about physical, I mean mental and spiritual knowledge to be shared with people that do not deserve to know that, except for your spouse. Except except for the person who you are going to spend the rest of your life with. It's for knowledge. It's for protection. 1 Corinthians 7, 2, 5. The guy in there says, you guys need to get married. (laughs) The church of Corinth had a real sex problem. They were just having sex with everything and everybody. There was a serious issue there. The guy came and said, hey, you guys need to find a woman. You need to find a man. You guys need to get married. You need to protect yourselves. You need to protect yourselves. It's for protection and it's for comfort. 2 Samuel 12, 24 says, David David comforted Bathsheba, his wife. She was going through a very hard time. And that bond, that oneness they had together comforted her. It comforted her. Guys, we need to save this thing we call sex for marriage because it's something that God created and instituted for marriage because he understood And he knew the damage that could be caused and that will be caused by having that prior to marriage. Here's five myths about sex. God is down on sex. No, God invented sex. I don't think God would be down on sex at all. Sex is purely physical. Sex is not just physical. It is not just an act of it is not just an act for us humans. It's a deeply emotional and, sp- and spiritual because God designed sex that way. He said in Genesis 2 that when two people have sex, they become one flesh. They become one. Sexual intimacy creates memories that we carry with us for the rest of our lives. There's no such thing as a quickie or a one-night stand. There's just not. You laugh about it. But there's not. When you share that intimate time with somebody else, you are giving a piece of yourself to them. And they're taking that. They don't deserve that. You're sharing a part of yourself with somebody that doesn't deserve it. They don't deserve that. This one I love right here. Sex is no big deal. It's just sex. Society and our friends often want us to believe that it's just not a big deal. Well, unfortunately, that's a lie. Sex is a huge deal. Why do you think they market it so much? Why do you think they pour so much money into it? They want you to think that it's nothing. But in all reality, it's huge. The problem is that we've become consumed with sexual images and we've just been numbed by the understanding of sex. We've been numbed by it. When we see something that's inappropriate sexually, instead of being like, whoa, what the heck's going on? We're like, oh, yeah. And you think that's funny, but that's scary. Why do you think sex trade in the United States is so rampant? Why do you think young girls are being picked up off the street and thrown into trafficking? It's because we have some type of sick, perverted urge for sex. And it's all because we have totally eroded the understanding of marriage and we've completely ripped out this understanding that sex is a spiritual, physical, and mental... I don't want to say thing, but thing... (laughs) That is designed for marriage. And we have totally eroded the understanding of what marriage is. There's more to it than just that. Sex brings a risk of lifelong consequences. Whether it's STDs, 
which is sexually transmitted diseases, whether it's teen pregnancy. Here, understand me. It's not that that baby's bad, but it's that the sense that that baby, most likely, 90% of the time, is not going to have the proper father and mother that it should, who are united as one. And a continual relationship, chasing towards God to give that child, that baby, a foundation to grow up on. Most likely that child's going to end up being put in some type of custody, some type of home where it's transferred around every three years, two years, six months, or it's going to go live with grandma. That's tough because the proper love is not there. Not that grandma doesn't love you, but it's a consequence. And again, hear me, it's a, it, the baby's not bad. The baby is a miracle, regardless of anything. It is a miracle. That's right, we're all miracles. But it's that understanding that that poor child is not going to get what it needs. <coughs> Spiritually, physically, mentally. It's not going to happen. What about Abuse. Abuse. How many of you ever felt used? You don't raise your hands. Have you ever felt used? Imagine being used sexually. Imagine somebody just telling you that they love you just because they want you. And then once they have you, they leave. There are consequences that go along with sex outside of marriage. And I love it. They say sex is no big deal. Well, you know what? If sex wasn't a big deal, these issues wouldn't exist. Am I right? If sex wasn't a big deal, then you would never feel abused. There would be no such thing as STDs. Those things wouldn't be around. Sex trafficking wouldn't exist. Listen. I'm not coming to tell you this to make your life stink. <laughs> Trust me. I'm coming to you to tell you this because I want you to understand that one, we're called to a higher understanding. And number two, I don't want you to experience heartache. I don't want you to experience loneliness. I don't want you to under, under, experience abuse. I don't want you to understand what it's like to wonder whether you're worth it whether you're good enough. Lots of people kill themselves because they don't think they're good enough. Lots of people take their own lives because they never think that they're worth it. It is a very sick disease that plagues us. Listen, sex is a big deal. It's a huge deal. I don't know, many of you just, you, you don't understand that. You don't see it. it's like a, a sheet pulled over your face. I'm hoping that through this you'll realize that. That sex was created for more than just our pleasure to enjoy whenever we want and with whoever we want. No, it was designed and created for a very specific time for a very specific purpose. And that's why God created it for us. He gave it to us to, to become one. He gave it to us to procreate, to make more humans. He gave it to us to enjoy and to worship. That's why God gave it to us. And lastly, man, everyone's doing it. That was my excuse. That was mine. All my friends were doing it. I was that last one who wasn't. That was awkward. That was, a, that was the biggest lie in the world. The biggest lie in the world. Last year, I pulled up this, this uh, statistic, showed that in high school, 50% of students who graduated were virgins. Now, for some of you, that might be a huge shock. But to me, it's not. Because there's one of two people in high school, three people, people who are really having sex, people who are not having sex and are really afraid to, 
because they know either it's not right or they're afraid of their parents, but they're telling everybody that they are because they want to fit in with everybody. And then thirdly, there's that person who's just saying, listen, I'm going to wait until I'm married. And I would, I would venture to say that uh, that statistic of 50% is probably greater. How many, of you, how many kids in your high schoolers, in your high school, how many girls are pregnant right now? A lot. How many you'd say? One, I mean, how many do you think? 20? Seven? No, there's a lot. There's at least 15. Okay, well, girls who have had babies within high school, within your high school. 10, 20, out of how many students are in your school? 2,400 students. So check this out. We can officially say that a school of 2,400 students, 20 of them are really having sex or have had sex. That's just a Pinellas Park High, right? That's just a Pinellas Park High. The other percentage, check this out. The other percentage is that percentage that is either in one boat. Oh, yeah, I'm doing it. Oh, yeah? You, you sure? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, they have no idea. Oh, yeah. They're just afraid of the peer pressure. And listen, shh, that's what got me was the peer pressure. That's what got me. And then there's that percentage that's like, psh, I'm not doing that. you got to be kidding me. It's because I believe that Jesus wants me to save it. Or maybe it's because it's their parents. Their parents have talked about it and said, you need to just wait. You need to understand what's going on here. This is not for you. You need to wait until you're married. I would assume that that percentage is probably higher. And the sad thing is that over and over again, we are bombarded with society telling us that we should be doing this now or you know, showing things that should be out there. You know, One of the things that shocked me, I was totally just blown away by this. There's something that came in our mail, a certain swimsuit company, showing the new bottoms that are coming out for the girls, for their swimsuits. You know what freaked me out? Listen to me. Listen to me. You know what freaked me out was this. One, it was a thong. There's no way around it. It was a thong. And number two, that some of you will buy that. And that number three, there are going to be old, nasty men checking you out. That is disgusting. No, no, hear me out. That is disgusting. If I ever have a daughter, one, that's not going to happen. Um, and number two, if I saw some old man checking her out, okay, not going to, my daughter, old man, no. But this is what freaked me out. This is what freaked me out. I said, oh, the new hot bottoms. The hot bottoms for the girls. This is what you're going to wear. And they're marketing that and they're pushing that and they want you to buy that. Listen, it's, you know what's ridiculous about it? It's the fact that if you dress like you want to have sex, girls, please tell me, what kind of guy are you going to attract? Some freaking pervert. That's it. Listen, no, hear me out. Shh, listen to me, hear me out. No, you, you laugh, but boys, you're in the, you, you are in the running for this category. Okay? Not for wearing the bad dress, but shh, shh listen. Shh, listen. If, if we see the girls, and I'm not blaming this on girls, because guys need to learn to control them. If we as, as women, I say we as like I'm one. <laughs> we as women. <laughs> if we as women, shh, if we as women dress in a way that is provocative. And I'm not, I'm, I, listen, my wife dresses gorgeous. All right? And I'm not just saying that because she's my wife. <laughs> And she dresses appropriately. And she dresses beautifully. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but listen, listen to me, listen to me. But, but she's not dressing in a way that's causing men, young boys in our, in our, in our youth group, or, or men to, to lust after her, to want to chase after her in that manner. It's not that she's not gorgeous and beautiful and worth it. It's just that she realizes that her body is a temple. She realizes that her body is worth it to keep for her husband and to keep for God. And not just for any man that's on the side of the street. And men, we have to learn to keep our eyes shielded. Because let me tell you something, there is nothing worse than allowing your mind to run on a rabbit trail that's never going to happen. It takes both. It takes a team. It takes us protecting the girls and the girls protecting us. Some of you think I'm crazy right now, but I am so serious about this. 
That's why when we go to the beach, I'm like, girls, I need you to put clothes on. Guys, I need you to put clothes. I want you to wear pants. I want you to like fall in the water and be like, you know? No, I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. It's not because I hate you. It's because I love you. And it's because I don't want something to happen to your spiritual life, to your physical life, to your mental life. Because I care enough about you to know that there is something so much greater and better for you. That was not in my notes. I really got to wrap this up. This is the last thing I want to talk about before we bust out of here, and it's this. Let me take a sip of water because this is going to be long-winded. There's one thing that uh, bothers me a lot, and Sean tackled it in his little comments there, was that he was labeled as a virgin. He was labeled like he was broke, like he wasn't worth it because nobody wanted him because he was still a virgin. Listen, hear me out. There is nothing to be ashamed of, not one thing. There's nothing to be heartbroken by about that. Keep that sacred. Honor that. Keep that to yourself until it's time to give to your spouse. Because let me tell you something, and I've experienced this coming from experience. Listen to me. There is heartache. There is drama. There is trash associated with not being a virgin before you're married. There's a point in your life when you're ready to get married. I'll probably be the guy that marries some of you. There's going to be a point, and we'll just hypothetically say that. There's going to be a point in your lives where you're going to come to me and say, God, JP, I'm ready to get married. I love this guy, this girl. We're going to, we're going to get married. I'm going to say, okay, this time we're going to counsel. We're going to get together. We're going to, we're going to counsel. We're going to talk about this. We're going to sit down in a room. We're going to go out and have some coffee, and we're going to counsel. We're going to talk about money. We're going to, we're going to talk about children. We're going to talk about your spiritual life. And then we're going to talk about sex. And then, I'm, then we're going to talk about, well, are you still a virgin? And you're going to want, in that meeting, you're going to want to tell me and not have to lie to me about it. You're going to want to tell me, yes, I am. You know why? Because that would be the quickest five minutes of my life. <laughs> <laughs> because if not, we're going to have to work through that with your future spouse. Because those are things that are in your closet that are going to have to be exposed. And you're going to have to work through them. My wife and I, I, we had to work through that. That sucked. We've talked about it now, a marriage. I wish that when I came to that point of marrying her and taking her for the first time, that that would have been my first time. Because that would have been beautiful. That would have been amazing. That would have been a connection that we would have had that I did not share with anybody else. Do you see what I'm saying here? This is so much more than just sex. It's so much more than that. It is a spiritual act. It is a physical act. It is a mental act. You have got to realize that. Being a virgin, there is nothing wrong with that. Be proud of it. Be proud of it. I'm not saying you got to wear a shirt. I'm a virgin. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, listen, don't let pressure take that away from you. Don't let peer pressure take that away from you. You're not ignorant. You know now. You know what it's created for. You know why God created it. You understand why it has been created. It is for you to worship and to become one with your future spouse. That is what it's been created for. You do not want to sit and have a conversation with me about that that crap in your closet. I don't want to. I will, but I don't want to. And if it has happened, you're not broke. It's okay. Physically, you cannot become a virgin again. Spiritually, you can ask God to forgive you. And you can make a commitment at that moment. And from that present time till you are married, you can make a commitment to God to stay pure in that type of relationship. 
And you'll still have junk in the closet you'll have to deal with, but it will be a lot less. It won't be stuffed. And guys, that goes for all types of sex, not just oral, not just physical, not just intercourse, any aspect of sex. God created it for marriage and the purpose of bringing two individuals, two, uh, bringing a man and a woman together. That's why he created it. It's worship. It's, it's sacred. It's, it's holy. It's, it's honorable. Guys, I thank you so much for allowing me the time to talk to you about this. I literally, for the last two days, have been a mess trying to bring this together. I really have. Because there's, listen, I, I use a program called Logos, where, where I come together and you can type in and it helps you with like Bible stuff. I typed in the word sex, and it was like, I thought my computer was going to take off. <laughs> because there's just so much scripture. There is, there's so much stuff in the Bible about sex. And it's not all good. There's some really sad and scary and terrible things that have happened in the Bible that relates to sex. And it was very difficult for me to come together to bring this, come to share it to you, to tell you very simply, and listen to me, very simply, keep it till you're married. Wait till you're married. God created it for you to enjoy in marriage and enjoy it there. That's what he created it for.